right. We have a guest on today that she's a repeat guest. I think I've been having several uh, guests on again this year that have been on in the past, because once you find people who know what they're talking about, you don't forget them. And so I, mm -hmm. I'm glad to have Kathy Gibbons back on the podcast, just so you guys will uh, remember who she is. She's a homeschool mom who first learned about logical fallacies, along with her seventh grade daughter which is pretty awesome because that's how we also learn sometimes when we teach others. She quickly realized that this little taught skill is essential for navigating all the crazy messages we are being bombarded with by culture. So she launched the Filter It Through a Brain Cell podcast where she teaches critical thinking in short, fun episodes and is passionate about helping the next generation learn to think well and love God with their mind. Kathy, thanks so much for being back on the podcast. I'm, I'm, I think this podcast episode is going to be a fun one because it's you and you're fun anyway. So you know. <laughs> tell that to my daughter, tell her how fun I am. <laughs> I know. And you tell Mike kids how fun I am. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Thank you, Shanda, for having me back. I'm super excited. As I was going through some of the ideas and uh, questions that you had sent, I thought, oh, this is going to be a good one. Yeah. It's, well, I, I just want to also let the audience know that I found you uh, I think Phoenix Hayes was like, you need to have Kathy on your podcast. <clears throat> and then I started listening to your podcast, which is fantastic because a lot of people like shorter podcasts anyways, especially when they're educational, like you're learning something and yours fits that bite-sized chunks of learning. And I appreciate that part. One, the other thing that I love is that I taught train your brain and I used every one of your podcast episodes went into a suggested uh, resource for all of my students on every fallacy that I taught. And you have so much more, but you're just, you're becoming that resource and people are know you now for providing the, the logical fallacies through your podcast. So I appreciate that. I That's do. awesome. I no, I appreciate that. And that was my whole goal with starting it was I want this to be so like I'm I get it. I'm a mom. I have a teenage daughter. I also help my husband run his business. I have a podcast that I'm doing. I wanted something that was going to be very user friendly so that parents could hit play in the car on the way to soccer practice and really get something out of it. Um, and I also really wanted to create a resource. That's why like I'm going on episode 199 right now and I'm thinking, goodness, how many logical fallacies are there and how many am I going to share? But I thought, no, this is a resource. This is, I want this to be something that people can access that they can go back to, that they can search, re-listen to. And so I'm really happy that you were able to use the podcast in that way with your course. I think that, um, anyways, that just made me really happy. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> no, we talked about you a lot. And I, I told the parents they needed to, to use you as a resource because learning learning logic isn't like a one and done. I think it's something that you yeah. need to keep your mind sharp with. So that's why, yes. like you said, you could continue to implement these podcast episodes with weaving in these fallacies for who knows how long. I mean, not only that, the culture just keeps giving you information, I'm sure. Yes. You use, so <laughs> you have them to thank. So there's no shortage of good examples of bad thinking. That's <laughs> for sure. Go. There you go. Well, we, we, well, I heard this on your podcast too. I'm I'm a your podcast stalker, I guess you could say. But I heard when you gave a brief history of when logic yeah. was taken out of the schools in the United States. And I wanted to revisit that because I think it's something that we need to be mindful of that there is a it's more of a strategic type of um it's a strategy to for people to get you to not think so well maybe yeah. and why so i wanted to to talk about that brief history again and if you can give us an overview of it and ask you why is it strategic if you think it is and and why so yeah it's super interesting so let me um it, logic did used to be did used to be does that i don't think that was proper grammar <laughs> It's logic okay. I don't have proper used, grammar. But yeah, logic used to be taught. It used to be considered to be important in the in the early colonies um, of the United States, and even in some of the early states. So let me give you kind of the how our educational system here changed. And then I did a little bit more research um, when you asked this question to see what's happened more recently in our education system. So I, I have kind of an add on to that. But basically, the gist of it was back in the 1800s. 
Prussia, the country of Prussia, 1700s ish, um, they their whole economy was based on their military. Their military was really, really good. And so they would rent out the Prussian army to other countries who were at war because they would win. And so they had this reputation of being able to win. And so this is how they made their money. Well, they lost a really devastating battle to Napoleon. And the king of Prussia was like, this is terrible. We can't lose because now nobody's going to want to hire us again. So he had all his smart people say, he said, okay, figure out what happened. Why did we lose this battle? So they dug in and they figured out that the reason they lost the battle is because soldiers were picking and choosing which generals they were going to listen to and which orders they were going to follow. They were thinking for themselves. Now, in the military, that's not a good idea. It really isn't. My husband was in the army and they have this saying that's at it goes salute and execute. When you're given an order, you are expected to say yes, sir, and to do it, to not ask a million questions, to not question, to not think for yourself and come up with your own idea. You're supposed to just do what you're told, right? That's how they maintain military order and all that kind of thing. So he said, the king said, all right, well, we can't have this. So let's figure out what we need to do to raise a populace in our country so that by the time the men are of fighting age and are ready to join the army, that they will just salute and execute. They won't pick and choose which orders that they're going to listen to. And so what they created is the modern day education system. They called it, it was like this um, factory type of education system where you put a kid in at, you know, four years old and they just kind of go through and everything about the system was designed to spit out somebody who would take orders and execute very, very well. And it worked. So they were spitting out soldiers, they were spitting out factory workers and bosses were happy, employers were happy, factories were happy, the military generals were happy. And so countries from around the world said, Park, this looks like amazing. We want good workers. We want good soldiers. So they sent representatives to go and study this system. Horace Mann is the representative from the United States who went and he brought it back to the United States. And they first started it in Massachusetts. The parents did not want it. They even showed up at the schoolhouses, little one room schoolhouses that we used to have with guns saying, no, we don't want this. Well, as we all know, Ed, uh, we did get it. This is our modern day educational school system is all based off this Prussian model. Now, even then, we still had logic as part of the required uh, learning studies. It was very important. It was very important to our founding fathers to understand logic and to learn it. Um, Benjamin Franklin, I think, even wrote a book about logic. So this was important to them. However, in the 19th century, for whatever reason, and this, I'll just tell you what I found, was the education reformers in the early 19th century decided that logic was not going to be required anymore because it had no social value. Now, I thought that was super interesting that the reasoning behind it were social reasons. They were letting what they felt like society, where society was at, dictate what they felt like was important rather than letting it letting say, no, these values are important. So let's let that dictate and inform society. They had it backwards. So logic wasn't banned, but it was no longer required. And so it kept getting pulled out, getting pulled out because they wanted to let's push math or let's, you know, and then the late 19th century, we had computers and right. Or all, all this other stuff. I'm sorry. I'm saying 19th century, 20th century. Um, we had computers that came in and there was just all these other things that were considered to be more important or more career helpful or more socially informative. And so logic just kind of went by the wayside. Now, not that you can't still get it. There's a few schools out there who still teach it. Maybe some classical academies, some private schools might, some universities, but most of them are it's like a special class that you have to take and you're considered to be one of the really smart ones if you take it. And it's so, so backwards. It used to be something that everybody got and everybody understood and everybody, it was considered that it was important to be a, you know, a useful member of society to have the skill and we just don't have it anymore. So anyways, it's just, it's kind of crazy how that happened. It is. And it's very interesting. And I think it's important that we know it because we know the, there was a, a systematic process to it yes. as well. And it was very strategic in the sense of, oh, look at what they're doing. Let's go implement that here. So we have people who comply more rather than think for themselves. Yes. And if you want people to comply, 
all you have to do is throw logic out the window and use all these appeals to emotion and, you know, fear mm -hmm. and all of that, which we might, we might get into. It depends upon which fallacies you and I want to discuss here yes. and, and, a, and a few <laughs> questions later, but now switching over to the church itself, I, mm -hmm. I don't know if your observation would be the same as mine. It might just depends upon, depend upon maybe our experiences with diff different yeah. church backgrounds that we were raised in or grew up in, or, you know, have been to, but I don't know that I see a lot of Christians emphasizing the the need to think well and to train their their brain and not only that as far as you know training in in logic and things I've heard the the terminology to love God with your heart and the heart is always mentioned in church like giving your heart to Jesus and I guess there you know you could say that's holistic of the whole person but I think it can be misunderstood if people don't don't take it that way. If they're not truly understanding that when you say heart, it embodies the whole person, including their mind. So, and I don't believe for a, a minute that God meant to compartmentalize the heart, mind, and soul when He said to love the you know the Lord with with all of those things. He's saying it's a whole person commitment and relationship. But I think it gets lost in translation when we use terminology like loving God with your heart. Why do you think it's imperative that we as the church emphasize learning how to think well in the culture that we're in? Oh my goodness. And I was just um, looking up the reference. Okay, there we go. Yeah, Matthew. So Matthew uh, 22, 37 through 39, right? Thou shalt love the Lord God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And so to me, I think, I think that is a key aspect that people are missing. Okay. So I've got a couple, a couple ways I want to go with this. So number one, I think the reason that it, you know, and again, like you said, this isn't every single church out there, obviously, but this is, I think a very common thing. And I think the reason that we aren't seeing it as much in churches is because we all grew up in that same school system. Mm. right? We all grew up in a school system that trained us. I mean, think about it. lots of churches, probably most church I've ever been to is set up kind of like a classroom. The people are in the audience. They're facing one person up on the stage who's talking and telling them and teaching. And we are trained that when in that environment, um, the teacher gets up, teaches us what we quote unquote need to know. We sit and we take it and think about it from high school. Did anybody ever go home and after history class, after science class say, wow, that was super cool. What they told me today, I want to learn more. And, you know, there might be some kids who did that, who are like kind of into a niche topic, but it's pretty rare that we think there's probably way more. Let me see if the teacher's right. Let me check on this. Let me dig into this deeper on my own. We just didn't do that. Most of us were just trying to survive and we want to go play sports, hang out with our friends. Let me just do my homework, do what's expected and move on. Yeah. So I think that we just kind of have that as part of our of our culture because of our education system. And so I think we just have brought that into church with us. Right. And so it's kind of crazy, like, okay, this it's cultural. It's our, it's our bias, so to speak, how we view the world and how we view um, the ways, the ways that we learn. So another thought on this, there are a lot of ideas out there that sound really good. And if we're not taught to question it, think about how many pastors will actually have the humility to say, go search this out on your own and see if I'm right. See if I'm wrong. There's a, I mean, God bless the pastors of America, but there's not a lot that would have the humility to be able to say that, to be able to, you know, to say, look, I want to be right above all things, search me out and, and see if I'm, and see if I'm not. So what happens, second Timothy four verses three and four says for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. And so I think that if we don't value wisdom, if we don't value truth, we are going to be open to any kind of cray cray idea, right? mm -hmm. it, to any kind of thing that somebody's saying that, oh, that sounds good, or I want that to be true, or I wish I was true, or that feels good to me right now. And so 
you know, and in contrast to that, we have the example from Acts 17, verse 11 of the Bereans. He's giving us the example of how two different groups of people approached what they were hearing. So here they are. So we've got, um, the verse says this, now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So here's these people. They are hearing from one of the greatest teachers of our faith, right? Yeah. So much of the New Testament is written by Paul, is his teachings. And every single day, they're going back and they're studying to see if what he said was true. And we just don't have that as a whole, as part of our general church culture. It's okay, I'm going to go see what the pastor has to say today. Maybe I'll like it. Maybe I won't. And then I'm going to go out and eat dinner afterwards. And that's probably it for a lot of people in terms of them digging into scripture. So it's really interesting. I do feel like um, the whole part of loving God with our mind is something that we could do, we could do better at. Yeah. It reminds me of too, like, I think of often the student teacher relationship because me being a teacher in most areas of, of what I'm doing right now and for such a long time in the classroom, I used to carry the weight of a student learning on my shoulders. Like if I don't mm. teach it right, if, you know, and then I realized one day when my students, a couple of my students weren't paying attention, I, so I told them, look, it's my job to teach you. It's my responsibility. But if you're not paying attention to what I say, you miss it because I'm not going to go over there and drag you along. Mm. As I've been reading through, I, I studied Mark last year at the, at the beginning of the year. And I saw where Jesus constantly told the student, be careful how you hear, be careful mm -hmm. how you hear. He would often question the hard heartedness and why they're not getting it. And so you saw that connection between it's not going to enter the heart and change you because it, your, your mind cannot even grasp what I'm saying. And Jesus would talk a lot in parables so that seeing they may not see and, and hearing they may not understand. Why? Because they weren't truth seekers. He spoke in such a way that the truth seeker, the one who wanted to truly get to the bottom of it and know, would seek that out and find out for themselves. So there's a huge responsibility placed upon the student to say, just like the Bereans did, okay, this is what you're telling me, but I have to go see if this is measuring up to the actual yes. standard of God's word. And I have, I also don't want to be too hard on the student because they have to be taught that they have to be encouraged to do that. They, and I think a lot of times because of the way the, the education system is structured and we're all sitting, like you said, within the classroom and there's one person up there, they're the authority. They must know. I don't have to question it. They're lecturing. I'm taking notes as if what they say is as good as gold and we're, the student isn't told hey, you are the gatekeeper of your own mind. You have to make sure that you weigh everything that you allow to come into it and enter into your heart. So I think that those are such great points and great observations because the church maybe needs to start thinking about owning that student-teacher relationship when it comes to sermons and Sunday school, youth rooms, and just overall whatever we're being yes. said, you know? Well, and it's so interesting. You talk, you know, in education, it's like we get, when we go to school, we are taught subjects. We're taught math. We're taught language. We're taught, right. History, fill in the blank. But the one thing we're not taught is the skill of learning. Yes. And it's two different things. Like it, it the teaching is different than learning. And this is why they always say the teacher learns the best because I think you have to go through a learning process in order to be able to teach. But if you're not doing that and you're just supposed to be the quote unquote learner, well, there are tools for learning, but how many of us actually get taught what the tools for learning are? I think we think it just is gonna happen naturally. And as you said, from your study of the book of Mark, it doesn't, even Jesus is like, look, y'all aren't getting this. Yeah. <laughs> I am saying it and you're not picking it up. So yep. it's, yeah, it's interesting. Very interesting. Very, something maybe needs to be written on that or maybe there is something written on it and I haven't found it yet. But anyways, very, very interesting subject there. So let's have a little bit of fun. I wanna know yeah. as you're, looking through social media and reading the news or listening to the news, what are the top 
let's just pick three. If you want to throw out another one or, you know, some more, you can, but what are like the top three fallacies that you see are mostly committed out there? And then I'll share a, just a three, about three of mine, see if they're the same. Yes. Okay. This was a hard one because I feel like there are so many of them that I see committed over and over and over again. You know, of course we have equivocation, which equivocation is when somebody changes the meaning of a word in the middle of an argument, or even in the middle of a sentence or in the middle of a meme. And they're, they're, they're cute. They're funny. This is where our puns come from, comes from yeah. equivocation, but we can also get into some really choppy waters when we say love is love. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, love the first love means something totally different than the second love, right? Because this is used to justify homosexual relationships and, and that kind of thing. So that's a version of equivocation. Another big one that I saw, and I just put these three down because these are ones that I have just seen recently because there's a whole bunch of them that happen all the time. Another big one is, um, okay, false analogy. I just saw a post um, where someone was comparing coloring your hair, they're saying, well, you color your hair and you fix your eyesight with glasses or contacts. So that's going to, that's basically the same thing as getting a sex change operation to oh, fix your gender. Yeah. And okay. So what that is, and if you don't know how to think, you could be like, well, yeah, that's true. I do change my hair and I do use contacts and I fix my teeth if they're crooked. But if you don't know how to think, you wouldn't realize, well, that's a false analogy because Coloring our hair and correcting our vision is not the same thing as mutilating our body and, and cutting off our, our sex organs, right? So right. that's a false analogy. That is a another fallacy um, that I that I see. I've got two more, but which ones yeah, have sure. you seen, Shanda? Well, I think because I'm on YouTube often with, even today I was getting notified after reels were posted and I'll see a lot of straw men or I'll mm -hmm. see uh, red herrings for sure. It's like, oh yes, when we're talking about like prayer, somebody will come up and completely change the subject or go in a different direction. I'm like, dude, what does that have to do with this? You know, like God doesn't exist. Why do we have to pray? Or, you know, it's just like um, those two. But I also see, I was listening to a, um, a presidential speech today by Joe Biden and there was so much, so many appeals to fear in yes. there. What I would call appeal to fear, maybe want, want to just generalize it, maybe appeal to emotion because it'll be like a stirring up of something where it's like, and if this doesn't happen, they want to put you in cages again, you know, something to that effect where it's like, it's, it's going both directions where all it is is emotion and just statements that have no merit, no evidence, nothing to back it up, but it's to stir the crowd on to hopefully get this end result of voting for me in this this yes. election and yes. i'm not saying joe biden's the only one who does it when it comes to politics or even just posting something on social media but we're going to see that a lot this year in 2024 and i would say um you know if you feel like you think oh my gosh like there's i think there are some people that i get my news from at times well, I, I don't know if I want to say that. Okay. That's giving a little too much credit. I do follow them on Instagram and I'll be like, look what's happening right now in, you know, Brooklyn, New York or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just like, dude, stop already. It's It's got to be this hyper awareness of this emotional stirring to get you to be like, what's going on in Brooklyn right now? You know? And I feel like even they do it. So you, they constantly get the views and things. Yeah. So there are so many times now recently when I've been like, I am so tired of seeing your just this is so like it's a sensational sensationalism you know yeah. so i would say those i think the reason why i see those uh the straw men or the red herrings a lot on youtube is because people don't say a lot they just want to slam whatever you're saying and then they get off and they're not speaking to the subject and they're trying to divert the conversation to some and get you totally off base and it's like that's not what I'm talking about. I will not answer that. I will not rebut that. If you want to know about the existence of God, go watch Frank's videos on cross-examine yeah. or listen to past episodes, but I'm not going to waste my time. So a hundred percent. No, you're right. And the sensationalism and the appeal, I would call it an appeal to outrage <laughs> in yeah. some of these instances, it happens um, on, on both sides. So here's another one uh, that I've been seeing a lot is the moralistic fallacy. And the moralistic fallacy says that because I think something is right, or I think something should be right, therefore it is. 
right? Mm -hmm. So for instance, we saw this when Roe versus Wade got overturned. There's this famous picture. You could, you could find it um, of this woman. She was protesting and she was visibly pregnant and she had written in paint on her belly, not a human or not yet a human. And I thought, there you go. This is, and she had a baby already in a stroller. So it's not even like this was her first one. And I thought, that's it. This is, she believes she wants abortion to be right. She wants the ability to kill an unborn child to be right so much that she is saying that it's not even a human yet because she thinks it should be right because she thinks this is how it, this is how it should be. And we see the moralistic, fallacy. I think it, so therefore it must be, or it should be. And um, another one, presentism. Okay. This is a big one. This is a way of analyzing history and looking at history where we interpret the past through our present day attitudes and moral values and standards. So this is why we look back and we'll look at things that happened in the past and we'll say how terrible they are or how awful, or how could we ever think, believe anything, our founding fathers, right? All this stuff, because we're looking at it through our values now. We're not looking at it through the values of society at that time. And obviously not that we're always gonna agree with everything that happened in history, but it's where we take what we think our values are and it can happen now. So people who are going down one road in progressive um, ideology, they can look back at their parents and judge their parents based on the values that they hold now. And, and it's just, it's this whole crazy idea of everything has to be filtered through my thoughts, through my feelings, through what I think is right, through what I think is true. And we put ourselves on the throne. We put ourselves, I am the God of my life yes. and what I believe it must be true and must be right. So therefore I can make these judgments about myself, about time past, about people in history and, um, we're just kind of in this crazy, crazy place because there's nowhere to go. How do, how does that ever end? If you play that out to the natural end, anything is an option. There is no more morality because right. anything you can imagine, if you think it's fine, it should be fine. And you know, it, there's, there's not a society that can, that can stand up under that. No, no, that's relativism at its I, I purest definition. And that means you can have a Hitler Nazi Germany all over again. And you can't say he's wrong because right. you know, that's what he thinks is right. I have a little middle schooler, 11 year old in my let's get real class. And we had our first, uh, class session the other night and she is, she's struggling with wondering if God exists. And our first lesson was, uh, does truth exist? And so, you know, I was going through the information that we have in the course and just saying, basically, according to the laws of logic, God either exists or he doesn't. So therefore, somebody outside this, the church or this room or your friend can say, God doesn't exist. And I would say God does exist, but we can't both be correct. And she raised her hand and said, well, technically, if God does exist and he's trying to get through to that person and they don't want him, they can close their mind and their heart off to him, right? And I thought that was very, a very articulate way to say it. And I said, sure. And she said, well, then you could technically say to them, he doesn't exist. And I said, does every belief, just because you believe it, does that make it true? I said, your beliefs have to align to reality otherwise because your beliefs cannot change reality and that's the problem see people think i believe it therefore it must be true yeah but we have to evaluate our beliefs and ask are they true and not only we have do we have to ask are they true we have to say what is the source of this belief where did i even come to this conclusion because a belief is a conclusion that you make about life yeah. about god about things what source fed this belief? Because can I rely on that source? And when you follow that back to its to its beginning, we're going to have God and Satan standing in the garden. And God said, here's the command, you will surely die if you eat from this tree. And Satan said, God, did God really say you're not going to die? Because if God, if, this, if the enemy can make you doubt who God is, then he can make you change that source 
I will, I will change the source that God is truth for something else. And many times we always think, oh, it must be Satan. Well, he's the deceiver. He can plant those lies, but technically you become the God of your own life because Eve looked at the tree and said, and thought, wow, this is desirable to make me wise. And the, the cell was, you can be like God. So we become the God of our own lives and we end up exchanging that source. And I, I think she's a reflection of the entire culture. I believe it. Therefore it must be true. And who are you to tell me that my beliefs are wrong? It's a very, yeah. very dangerous dangerous way to think. You summed that up perfectly. And, and the thing that's crazy is we even have that in Christianity, people believe things to be true or to be false because they think it's right or because it's wrong, but it's true or false because of God, because God says so, because it's God's design, because this is his world. This is his creation because he is truth. And I don't even know that we have that as a foundation to stand on. And so um, that's what makes it an option for there to be any interpretation. So yeah, you summed that up very, very, very well. Well, speaking of God's word, Romans 12, two is Romans. The book of Romans is great. Anyways, chapter 12 is amazing. It starts with therefore, and therefore is that transition word. Now we look at everything Paul said before. And then chapter 12, he's saying, therefore, let me talk to you about how to apply this, how to live this out. And he talks about how we are to transform the mind or be transformed by the renewing of our minds, because everything was affected by the fall, including our minds. And I know this is done by the Holy Spirit. So I don't want to take that away and be like, just learn logic and you don't need the Holy Spirit. I, that's, that's not true. And that's not what we're saying. Just wanted to make that clear. But what responsibility do we have as Christians um, to be intentional about the transformation of our minds? Yes, I think we have a huge responsibility. The verse that popped up to me is <laughs> 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And I thought, wow, that is some really strong language. That is almost military fighting language right there. Take captive, not just some thoughts, every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And one of the ways that it has. So, so this is very active on our part. This yeah. implies we are doing something. We are actively choosing and setting our hearts and setting our minds that we are going to do something. And we're going to take our thoughts captive. We're not going to let them run us, but we are going to exercise dominion over our thoughts and we are going to make it obedient to Christ. So that means checking scripture. Is this thought in alignment with scripture? Is this thought in alignment with truth? right? Where, what does this even look like? Ask the question, the question I always ask my podcast, is it really true? And so to me, this is a very active thing that we're doing, not to mention all the times in scripture where we are told to seek wisdom, to get knowledge, to get understanding Proverbs, right? Is you almost can't, if you open to a book in Proverbs and put your finger down, every single chapter is going to have something about wisdom. Every page yeah. is wisdom and knowledge. You know, Proverbs 16, 16, how much better to get wisdom than gold, to get insight rather than silver. So this is something that we are to highly seek after that we have to actually do. And, <laughs> you know, and I think, well, I'm gonna, I'm I'm doing an episode right now that's coming out tomorrow on how to think about conspiracy theories, right? How to think well and how to think with wisdom about conspiracy theories because we got people, some who are out there like it's all dumb and ridiculous, and then there are some that they're just looking under rocks to try to find a conspiracy theory, and they'll turn anything into one, right? And we've got this. It's like everybody's losing their mind about the conspiracy theories, and. To me, it's like, okay, no, we have to have wisdom with this, right? We seek the mind of Christ. We make our thoughts obedient to Christ because it's, it, there is such a thing. So on one hand, we're, we're told we need to have wisdom. We know how to live. The Bible tells us that the Kings conspire. We know that this mm -hmm. is true. He tells us this is true. And also scripture tells us, Ecclesiastes tells us that, you know, it, the whole first chapter of Ecclesiastes, he starts talking by, I sought wisdom. That was the thing that he asked God for. He asked God for wisdom. God gave it to him. You know, and he says, I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is chasing after the wind for with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. 
And this is where I think as Christians, why we have to bring our thoughts under the obedience of Christ, because we don't want to be so captivated by just every idea that's out there or conspiracy theories under rocks. And I have to know everything about, about everything. And like you said, being on the, on the news and following people on social media, where it's like, we can know something that's going on all around the world at the same time right now. And Solomon says, with much wisdom comes much sorrow and the more knowledge, the more grief. And sometimes I feel like we are spending so much time trying to find out so much stuff without exercising wisdom, without putting it to the obedience of Christ, that we are bringing grief on ourselves. We are bringing sorrow that we're not meant to, to, to bear. We're not God. We're not meant to know all the bad things happening in the world simultaneously and carry them and, and be on the constant outrage train that you talked about. We're not meant to do that. We're meant to worship our creator. We're meant to live in truth. You know, I have been convicted by this. Have I spent as much time in scripture as I have spent, you know, looking at the news and seeing what's going on in the world and going down rabbit holes? And I have been convicted by this. So it, to me, we are to, wisdom says we need to live in a balance where we know what we need to know to live a godly life, to live a good life, to make a difference. And there's things about the world we need to know in order to do that. And then at some point we have to have the discipline to say, and that's where it ends for me right now. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, I kind of went on a little that's bit of so a tangent good. No, there. I love it. I love it. I love that you're doing a podcast episode on that. That's going to be fantastic. Yeah. I, I just got to interview um, Connor Boyack from Tuttle Twins on, he wrote a book on conspiracy theories. I've been wanting to do how to think about conspiracy theories because goodness knows this is like a thing these days yeah. and people are on all sides. People are like, yeah, they're all true. Every single one of them. And then there's some like, they're all ridiculous and you're an idiot if you believe them. And I thought, okay, we have to know how to think about this well. So yeah. yeah. That's so good. My niece said the other day, cause uh, my parents took my son and a couple of my nieces and nephews to New York in December. And I was like, Oh man, you know, I'm not sure about New York right now. Things I I've seen, like you said, the protests and different things going on. And just a couple of days ago, she said, auntie, the, you, you find all of these things on social media, like this is happening here. This is happening there. And she said, we went to New York and there weren't any protests and I, it didn't feel violent. And so she said, I just feel like when you see these things on your phone, it can make you upset or nervous, but when you're living your life, you don't see a lot of those things. Yeah. And I said, that's true because when I go out my door and I'm in the neighborhood and go to the grocery store, people are cordial to each other. People aren't saying the things that they say to each other on a, on yes. social media. And I'm not saying that people aren't mean out there and we don't have problems. Don't get me wrong. But I am saying if I didn't have this little rectangular thing in my hand, I wouldn't feel half as worried about this year as I, as I would without it, because, you know, living life, God, God is taking care of us. And thank God we still live in a great country. I pray that we always do, but yeah, you're right. Why go down rabbit holes and look for things to have all this knowledge about to fret over. And my pastor said the same exact thing you said right now. He said it on Sunday, cause we're, we're studying Ecclesiastes for the next six weeks. And he said the same thing, more knowledge. And sometimes having all of this information at our fingertips doesn't make us more blessed people. It makes us right. more anxious people because we shouldn't know what's happening, you know, in Timbuktu right now, because they didn't, they didn't just 30, 40 years ago. So excellent points. So let's face it. We already talked about the education system the likelihood of my kids learning logic in school right now is, is slim if, if at all, because it would have to be like an elective of some sort, if they're going to do it, it's yeah. not a requirement. It's not in the state, the federal standards for education, or even the state standards that I know of, especially coming from California and being now in South Carolina. But um, there's something we can do about it still as parents and be proactive, be intentional about it. Uh, what are some immediate things that you can suggest for families to do this together to make it happen? And can you provide maybe some top three resources that you would say these are go-tos? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, okay. Number one thing that my dad did that I hated as a kid, but looking back now, I so appreciate and tr we try to do for my daughter and she loves it as much as we did is he would, what we called narrate, <laughs> he would narrate 
everything. It could be a movie that we're watching. He would like just make comments all throughout it about the characters and what they did and and what his thoughts about them. Or if we would be driving down the road and there'd be a billboard, he would just make comments. And we're just like, can you stop narrating everything? We know, we see it. But what he was doing is he was imparting his worldview to us through daily life, right? Because it's, we, we all think that, how are we going to teach our kids? Oh, oh. we're going to sit them down and let's have this big conversation about, well, that doesn't work with teenagers. They don't want to sit down and have your big lecture, right? right? So what he did is he was just constantly telling us his worldview. He was teaching us how he looks at and thinks about the world. And so my encouragement to parents is just say it, just do it. If they roll their eyes, so what? If they, if they say, I know, that's okay. Just do it, do it anyways, because they need to hear how you think. They need to hear how you look at the world and how you think about it. Number two is ask questions, ask really good questions. And this was a hard one for me. I'm not a natural good question asker. My husband is, I'm not, I've had to learn it. But the number one question that I always start with is, is that really true? right? Just ask, is that really true? That's a great one to start. Well, what do you think about that? How do they know? Well, how does that compare to this? Just ask the questions because that teaches them to start asking questions as well. So in terms of resources, obviously I'm going to start with train your brain course that you did and the filter through brain cell podcast, right? I mean, great ways to learn. And here's the thing. I've got a couple different resources that I wanted to share because different people learn different ways. So you know what you need for your family pick, just pick one and go with it. Yeah. Go with whatever's going to work. Um, on social media, I really enjoy red pen logic by Tim Burnett. He's awesome. He takes memes and he fixes them and he'll point out the bad thinking and he'll point and he's an apologist. So he does it from God's word. I think it's a great resource there. Like you could show it to a kid and have a conversation about a meme. I think it's awesome. Um, for if you're a homeschooler, or if you just want to add in a subject for your kid in their school, master books has a really great, um, book. It's a workbook. It's all on logic. So intro to logic. If your kid needs to write and read stuff to learn, that's a great way to do it. The fallacy detective book is really great for middle schoolers. It's super fun to learn from. And then, you know, lastly is be a Berean. So pick a topic and dive in as a family, learn how to study God's word, get a concordance. You can get a concordance app for your phone or buy an actual book and, and dive in and study. What does this word mean? And what does that word mean? And actually show your kids what it looks like to be a Berean. Take this sermon that your pastor preaches and say, let's look at this. Let's look at this at home and see if this is actually true and, and dive in and just give them some practice. So that would be it. Yeah, that's great. You did mention your podcast, right? Uh, yes. Filter okay, through good, a brain cell. Yeah. And I, yep. I can't speak highly enough about it. And maybe it's good that I, I can take over that, that part of it from here. But while I, I take my middle schooler to school and pick him up and he took train your brain uh, with me, but what I love about it is that he's always identifying fallacies now, but you, you on, on yours, you go through much more than we even put in to train your brain. So you like, even today, a couple of the ones that you had mentioned with the moralism or I don't remember what you yeah, said. The moralistic. Yep, yep. Yeah. The moralistic fallacy. Um, we didn't go over that one, but you have a lot of those and continue to expand that. And so it's really great it, it's even shorter than our car ride. I think our car ride's 15 minutes. And so your p- podcast is, it's a good, put it on, discuss it afterward. And it keeps those fallacies fresh in his mind too, because sometimes he'll even tell me, is this an appeal to, you know, whatever. And so it's, it's just a continual learning and refreshers. We need those refreshers all the time. So I love that. And then I get, I get my emails from you whenever you're sending out your subscriber emails to yeah, Kathy. Yeah. So people need to know is it's filter it through a brain cell.com, right? That's it. Yep. Yeah. And I'll put all that in the show notes too, because definitely like you guys have to get in touch with Kathy, get connected with her and start this whole family, um, educational. I I make it, it's so fun. I I think you're fun, Kathy, the way that you do it. So it's not like begrudgingly doing it together. And as far as you you saying your dad, like used to drive you guys crazy. I'll do that with my kids on movies and they do get annoyed with it. Like, but there are times when we're driving around and there's a couple love yourself billboards around here. And they'll be like, look, look at that billboard. It says, love yourself. But it's really great to point to those two and talk about the worldview behind them. So they get, they start seeing all of these beliefs and ideas are coming from 
a worldview of which has tenets of their own, you know, these different belief systems. And why do they believe that that is true? Why? Let's analyze that. So very great informal activity that makes for great discussion. And I appreciate you mentioning that. So just go ahead and tell us again, like the name of your podcast, what your website is and how people can get in touch yes. with you. So it's filter it through a brain cell. Um, website is filter through brain cell.com. And I actually have a free quiz. If you want to take it, it's yes. either for you or for your kids. Filter it through braincell.com forward slash quiz. There are 10 different memes on there. And um, see how you do it at guessing which fallacy is in each meme. So yeah, it's super fun. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I'm so thankful that Kathy was back on the, the show today. I love talking to her, love following her, listening to her and learning from her and you can too. So I'll have all of that information in the show notes if you have any questions for her, but I can't, I can't encourage you enough to take the reins this year and say, how are, is my family going to learn to love God with all of our mind and give God the opportunity to transform our mind as we dive in and become students if, in logic and good thinking? If you have any questions for me, you can email me at hello at and I'll catch you on the next one.